Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. And if you are watching us on YouTube, and I appreciate it if you are, you know, you can also catch us on all of those fine podcast platforms that are out there, Spotify, Apple, uh, Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you are listening to us on one of those fine podcast platforms, you can watch us on YouTube. Please subscribe to the Lunch Hour podcast, leave us a review, and let everybody you know know about what's going on on the Lunch Hour. Uh, the, the listenership is growing, and we appreciate the feedback we're getting uh, from our listeners. I'm, I'm very excited. I, I'm always excited for our guests, particularly excited for this guest this week. He's an old colleague of mine, longtime colleague of mine, I should say, because he is certainly not old. His name is Ben Lieberman. He's a senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. He works on energy and environmental policy, very, very important in this day and age. And today we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the intersection of these policies and international affairs, sort of tying in a lot of what we do here at the Federal Newswire on policy and business and economics, and certainly China. Uh, but just to tell you a little bit more about Ben, uh, he's been back at CEI for a while. Uh, before that, he was up on the Hill. He was counsel to the U.S. House Committee on Energy and Commerce. Uh, he worked for the Heritage Foundation for a few years. Uh, I believe he's a lawyer, though I don't have his law degree in, in front of me. Um, but uh, his bona fides there. But as I said, I've known Ben. Holy cow, Ben, I think I've known you for just about 25 years. Is that possible that we've known each other that long? I think it goes back to the turn of the millennia. Yes, yes. When we were all when we were all agog and nervous about Y2K, imagine how far we have now we have now come. Um, <laughs> imagine if AI had been a factor in the whole Y2K environment and the panic that would have caused. Ben, you know, one of the great things about CEI uh, is the work that you guys do on not just energy and environment policy and really all kinds of policies, but CEI has really made its mark on being able to translate the policy implications for the decisions that are made at all levels of government into how they affect people. Um, and this goes back years ago. I remember the video that uh, our, our friend and mentor Fred Smith put out uh, about climate policy, showing somebody trying to drive around, ride around in a snowstorm in a bicycle. We are seeing this play out in a very real way in terms of electric vehicle mandates. Talk about the the the, the issue of electric vehicles and why they're not the great promise that the left seems to promise to us. Talk a little bit about this. Well, yeah. Uh, and the great thing about uh, where I work is we can follow uh, – our, our goals of free markets and limited government, wherever wherever we think think those arguments are needed. I'm the gas stove guy yes. for uh, a, a example. But it all comes back to freedom of choice and consumer choice and allowing people to purchase and use the products they want and to not have the federal government mandating choices. That's true of gas stoves. That's true of, uh, of, of, uh, 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 of the push from gas to electric stoves. It's true of, the, of, of, the, of a similar push from gasoline-powered to electric-powered vehicles. The consumer demand beyond a niche product just is not there, and for good reason. Well, it's interesting, right? Because, you know, we go back to, remember when there was that, that whole thing when Bernie Sanders was on the stump, I want to say it was 2016, and he was talking about the issue of how many different kinds of shoes there are and how many different kinds of toothpaste there are. I think he was also talking about how many different kinds of shampoos there are and how this was a bad way to allocate things in the economy, which I found stunning to me. But the fact is, if, you know, if consumers want something, and it's obviously it's a legal product, I mean, this is this is actually the most efficient way of sort of allocating resources in the marketplace, is it not? Absolutely. And even if it wasn't the most efficient, it's what people want. Right. And we respect freedom more than one size fits all efficiency. And of course, the one size fits all crowd never achieves any kind of efficiency. But uh, the, the, the real issue is that every consumer is different for a well-to-do person who already has a gasoline-powered car, can use an EV for short trips, that's fine. But say for the one-third of American households that are single vehicle, 
households, including many uh, lower income ones. Realistically, an EV just can't serve as that one vehicle. So there's a lot of examples of people who quite logically don't want to choose an EV. So this push towards an all EV world leaves a lot of folks behind. You know, it's funny. I, I was uh, I was with our uh, former uh, CEI colleague, Jerry Rogers, over the weekend up in New York. And we took a, an Uber ride. Obviously, there are folks on the left who hate Uber for all sorts of reasons. But I took they took I took an Uber ride. And I was, t- and the Uber driver picked us up in an electric vehicle. It was not, uh, uh, it was not a Tesla. I don't remember which brand it was. It was. I was struck by the fact that it wasn't a Tesla. And we're talking about it. And there are a lot of cab drivers in New York that use electric vehicles. We can understand why. But I was talking to him about his experience with it, and he's like, you know, it's one of these things where I thought it'd be great. Uh, and obviously, there are uh, all kinds of regulatory benefits to having it. Uh, all kinds of incentives in New York. But the reality is, right, I don't have a charger at my home. Um, and when I go somewhere, sometimes I have to wait literally hours before I could even then spend the hour and a half to charge my vehicle. I mean, this gets to the point that we all that we all make. I'm sorry, Ben, I'm going to pontificate for a second. It's like the meme that is going around right now. You know, talking about how if we were to move to an all electric fleet or if we had already been all electric. And someone said to us, came out and said, hey, I've got this miraculous new engine for cars. You can fill it up in three minutes or five minutes, and it's good to go. It goes uh, 400 miles on a tank full of fuel. It's half the weight. It, 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 you know, it, it, uh, it won't destroy roads, all of these things. And it's called the internal combustion engine. People would clamor for it. I mean, this is this is where we are, isn't it? The sort of the absurdity of 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 uh, the, the federal one size fits all policy. Yeah, if gasoline powered vehicles were on the market, the central planners would be trying to push them onto the market. Uh, and and a lot of people don't know actually, the gasoline powered vehicle was considered a, a, an environmental benefit right. when it came out. Cities had thousands and thousands of horses back <laughs> in the day, which means horse manure, horse urine. Dead horses all over the place every day. The gasoline-powered vehicle came along. It was a tremendous improvement in in public health. We forget those those things. And you're absolutely right. The gasoline-powered vehicle, in terms of convenience, 150,000 gasoline stations across the country. You can pull up in five minutes, get enough juice or get enough fuel to go 400 miles. That's a tough act to follow. And I would like to think that the EV proponents have respect for people's time, but it's clear that they don't. Right, right, right. You know, it's funny because that's one of the things I've talked about with Wayne uh, Cruz, your colleague at CEI, is the idea of expressing regulatory burdens in terms of time. Because time is the only resource that we really truly do have a finite amount of. We can't make any more of it. Let, let Let me switch gears for a second. Uh, and get to something else you were just recently blogging about. Um, saw a post the other day from, it wasn't U.S. PERG, it may have been Maryland PERG, the Public Interest Research Group, talking about the need to ban gas stoves, to ban gas stoves because of the impact on children's health. And I sat there and I said, this is a load to go back to what you were saying about cities. It's a load of horse manure because you and I both know that it is hyper-efficient HVAC systems, these recirculating systems where you get all kinds of crap that recirculates through the ventilation that actually drives up incidents of childhood asthma and other kinds of respiratory illness. But talk about this myth and talk about this drive to ban the gas stove. Well, the first thing that strikes me as suspicious about all these claims of, uh, of a public health danger is that gas stoves have been very, very common since the middle of the last century. Yeah. I grew up around one. You probably grew up around one. You know, 100 million or more kids grew up around one. And that there's some dire threat that we hadn't noticed until lately strikes me as strange. The other thing is that the people claiming these uh, gas stove uh, asthma links, they're joined at the hip with the climate activist right. community, which is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into this effort to electrify homes. The same people who want to stop using gasoline in favor of electricity in vehicles, they want to do the same thing for uh, natural gas use for stoves or water heaters or furnaces uh, in our homes towards the electrification of everything. 
The electrification of everything doesn't make economic sense. Natural gas is three times cheaper on a per unit energy basis. It doesn't make economic sense. And it doesn't even make environmental sense because the electricity has to be right. generated somewhere. And we're decades away, if ever, from a wind dominated grid. And I think if ever is looking to be the overwhelmingly likely possibility given the intermittency problems. Me- so this is caught up in the climate craziness. EVs are, are like gas stoves in that regard. Let's but let, let's talk about this issue of, of energy generation, because as I've estimated, if we were to move to an all EV fleet, which we're not going to do, but if we were, it were, were, would require between three and five times as much electricity being generated. We get rid of gas stoves and move to electric stoves. Um, that, you know, increases demand, you know, uh, another X fold, whatever, whatever it is. And so the question is, you're right, if there is, if we're not, well, A, the first question is, where is that power going to come from, especially in light of the fact that we're not building any more nuclear power? But is it also been, and I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist here, but I am going to raise a conspiracy theory in the same way that I think that some of the moves, you know, to get, you know, people out of their cars and into mass transit to get them into cities, because we now have, you know, coupled with the generation issues are the so-called smart meters, right? Which take over and and have somebody else decide what kind of electricity use you can have. I, I mean, ultimately, if we can't generate the power, doesn't it mean that someone is going to flip the switch as to as to whether or not you can use electricity at any given time? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's not a crazy conspiracy theory that uh, that this is an agenda being advanced by people who want more control over our lives. There's, there's no other explanation for all the things being done, which I mentioned make no economic sense, but don't even make that much environmental sense. I, I think in many ways, uh, climate change is a pretext for, for things that a lot of uh, a lot of folks uh, left of center have been wanting to do for decades. Right. It, it, you know, what's amazing to me. And CEI has done really well with um, their eye videos, eye pencil, eye whiskey. Um, and, it, and it seems to me that there's an opportunity here uh, for a group like CEI, if not CEI itself, to, to do a, some kind of video about the short-sightedness of, call it eye petroleum or eye oil. Because, right, if we ban natural gas stoves and we sharply ramp down on that, if we if we get rid of gasoline-powered cars, we still need oil for a whole host of other things. And then oil is going to be distilled down and the, 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 uh, the uh, petrochemical molecule is going to be cracked into various distillates. So are we not supposed to... Are we not supposed to burn the benzene? Are we not supposed to burn the methane? Are, are we not supposed to use all of you know, what, what they would say in, in the butchering industry from from uh, 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 nose to tail? Are we not supposed to use from nose to snout to tail uh, of oil? Or what are we supposed to do with methane and benzene and all of these other distillates that come out when you when you crack a, a, a petroleum molecule? Yeah, the things that we get from a barrel of oil is a very long list of, of products and uh, and uh, uh, um, and materials that 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 things are made for from uh, the people that are talking about completely banning oil, natural gas. They really have not thought through all that will mean for for the economy, for all the things that make modern life possible. You're you're, you're absolutely right. It isn't just a matter of. Uh, of not making gasoline for our cars, not making natural gas for our homes. Uh, almost everything around the home nearly is can, 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 can trace its origins to a petroleum or natural gas product. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of bad news on the horizon if this agenda is allowed to continue. Right. It, 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 is, it is amazing to me. Um, let's, let's, just, let's, let's shift gears because you guys, you know, CEI is, is known, if, if for nothing else, and I know you guys are known for plenty of other things, but if nothing else, you guys have been a bulwark on the climate craziness agenda long before I think anybody else was. The work that you've done, uh, the work that Myron Ebel was doing, the now now retired Myron Ebel, uh, work of, of Jonathan Adler and others. I'm going to see how many times I can name drop CEI uh, people, uh, Ben. Um, but, you know, the, this, is, this is a long time coming. 
Let's talk a, a little bit about where things stand now, uh, because I don't think we've lost the fight, but obviously uh, on, on you know, both the domestic and international side of things, things are very, very tough. Talk about where things stand right now. Well, I think, you know, the bad news generally is that uh, the, the private sector seems uh, all too resigned to all of this. Uh, maybe the worst example is the auto industry's response to the EV agenda when they must know that uh, EVs are going to be a hard sell, but they went along anyway. There, there's a lot of that going on. And when you don't have the pushback from the, the regulated uh, industries, then where can it come from? Uh, um, you know, free market groups like CEI, that we're, 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 we're not that well funded or, 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 or powerful a voice. But I think the reality in the end is this stuff just doesn't work. Yeah. A, 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 a grid dominated by wind and solar is not going to happen. EVs dominating the roads, not going to happen. Everybody giving up their, their gas stoves, not going to happen. And so the, the, the practical realities are going to bring this agenda to an end. The concern is how much damage will have been done when we reach that point. You know, it, it's funny. I had a conversation with uh, somebody in the auto industry. Uh, about the EV mandate and what was going on. We were talking about how, you know, Toyota was being caught behind the eight ball because their hybrid vehicles were not being included in, in you know, these EV mandates, which again is just an, an insane way of looking at it. Um, you know, Toyota had done all of this work to try to make some kind of compromised position. But I asked this person, I said, why isn't your why isn't your company pushing back harder? And he said, well, the problem is that we had a, a situation with a federal regulatory agency, a, a safety agency a few years ago. And as part of our settlement agreement, we had agreed to put on, I, I know I, I, are you, you're familiar with what's going on with the Loper case at the Supreme Court, the deference case? A little bit, yeah. The same kind of situation with Loper, right? With Loper, they have, the, the issue is, the National Marines Fisheries Service has required that they put a, a fisheries um, a person on the fishing boats at the expense of the fishing boat owner's you know, expense, at their expense. Um, at, by the same token, this automaker had agreed to have a safety inspector embedded within the company to watch over their operations for a discrete period of time they paid this person a salary, um, but they didn't want to rock the boat because it was up to this inspector, this federal inspector, as to whether or not his or her continued supervision of the company was going to continue. And they were they were afraid that if they raised they raised the specter over the EV mandate, that they were, were going to have to continue to spend literally millions of dollars on this person embedded in their midst. I mean, this is part of the problem with the massive regulatory state and how much power these agencies have, right? There's an incredibly coercive power. And you and I both know that there are rent seekers that are out there here. But, right, I mean, this is this is part of the problem. Half of it is, you know, half of them can use the, um, the mandates to drive out their competitors. The other half are so scared of retaliation that they don't want to do anything. It really puts the status in the catbird seat, Ben, doesn't it? The federal regulatory state is just one big Stockholm syndrome. You're, 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 <laughs> you're, 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 you're absolutely right. It's the comprehensiveness of, of it all. You can't fight one regulation because that agency and other agencies have you under their thumb for other regulations where they have discretionary uh, authority. So it, it is tough to, uh, to, to fight back. Another factor is uh, balkanization. California will set their own right. auto regulations, their own appliance regulations and manufacturers don't want to have to build to a, a, a different set of standards for California and the dozen or so copycat uh, states. So they come running to Washington. What I don't like about that is that whatever California does is almost always incredibly dumb. Right. And do we really want the federal government to uh, mandate that foolishness on the other 49 states or however many states who uh, who, who, who didn't want it? So th th the list is long why regulated industries uh, don't fight back. And as you mentioned, sometimes they benefit at the expense oh, sure. of some of their um, 
some of their competitors. That's why the focus should always be on what's best for the consumer, what's best for the homeowner, and what's best for the for the larger principles of of of, of freedom. Right, 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 right. What serves to empower people and what serves to disempower people. Empowering people to act on their own behalf is always better than disempowering them. That that's you know I, 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 that's you know a core principle of mine. So let's turn Ben to one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you on today, you've just done an an extraordinary report. It's really great stuff here about China. It really is amazing to me about China and energy, global energy policy and how China is being treated. Um, Talk, talk about this because this is so important. Well, um, There's so many ways that the climate change agenda plays into China's hands. We talked about EVs and where so many of the the, the batteries and components for the the, the EV batteries are are going to, uh, to, uh, to, to come from. But maybe the most egregious example of that is that China still gets classified by the United Nations as a developing nation under these uh, climate treaties. I'm talking about things like the 1987 Montreal Protocol, but mainly the 1992 United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which really kicked off the uh, the international right. climate agenda. As you could argue, back in 87, back in 92, China really was a developing nation. Right. So classifying them as one um, might have made sense back then. But the classification was never changed. And fast forward to today, China is the world's second largest economy, the world's largest exporter, the largest emitter of many of the uh, of the things that are the subject of uh, these treaties. But they still get treated as a developing nation, which gives them a very clear unfair advantage over the U.S. and other developed nations for a number of reasons. Well, well let's talk about those advantages, because that's it, it, it seems like this is proof positive as to the relationship between the regulatory state and economic prosperity, right? I mean, we can and we can go back and forth as to the prosperity of the average Chinese citizen, but set that all aside. The overall Chinese economy, talk 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 about that. Well, for one thing, under these treaties, developing nations get more lenient treatment. For example, the 1987 Montreal Protocol that was the one that banned Freon and made air conditioners more expensive. But developing nations got a got an extra 10 years to keep on using Freon. And, and in addition, some of these uh, chemicals are also uh, um, used in manufacturing processes. So using the older, better chemicals is something that Chinese manufacturers uh, can do that the U.S.-based or, or, or other uh, developed nation-based manufacturers can't do. So there's a clear advantage in terms of uh, in terms of weaker compliance and for the the, the, the climate change uh, 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 provisions China can still use affordable reliable coal-based electricity and they're taking full advantage even as the US and, and, and European nations are moving away from coal towards more expensive and more intermittent uh, uh, sources and of course higher energy costs could be a real advantage for American manufacturing, but we're throwing away that advantage by allowing China to uh, to continue to use low cost coal when we increasingly have to uh, shut down uh, those plants. So uh, more lenient treatment under these under these environmental treaties. Also, believe it or not, these treaties have um, um, foreign aid provisions, multilateral funds they're called that al- that allow developing nations, poor countries. To get um, um, compliance assistance from rich nations, and surprise, surprise, the U.S. as we are the biggest contributor to the U.N. overall, we're the biggest contributor to uh, this foreign aid, and so China can get assistance from U.S. tax dollars to help them move ahead with this advantage over us. It's it, it's really that bad. I want to be really clear about this, right? As China, and we all know about the the, the you know the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, China's uh, flexing of soft economic power abroad by in and of itself giving aid to other nations in terms of infrastructure that it then down the road essentially repossesses and owns. Um, <laughs> we are essentially subsidizing China's efforts to become the dominant. The, the the dominant economic power on the planet and the dominant political power on the on the planet but obviously because china is using that money so effectively on the global stage it makes it almost impossible 
to get this status changed, doesn't it? Talk, talk about that, Ben. Yeah, well, I, I, I would add the, 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 the amount of the aid in these multilateral funds, it's not tremendous. We're talking millions, not billions. But the fact that it's anything is, is, is particularly repugnant given China's uh, conduct. Uh, again, they're treated as a developing nation. Developing nations arguably deserve some help. Sure. Uh, from 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 rich rich countries, how effective that is, that's another matter entirely. But the foolishness of continuing to treat China as a developing nation is one of the reasons why I'm glad Congress is finally taking a look at this classification. It, it, it's a good thing, I, and you know, it's one of those things, right? Where again, to to bring up to invoke the name of of Fred Smith, CEI's founder and first president. Right. Fred used to say that the, the thing about environmental protection in rich nations is that rich nations can afford to make those priorities. It's poor nations that can't. They're just trying to do best by expanding their e- economies. Uh, you, you have an op ed that just came out. Uh, I want to say it was in The Hill uh, just late I, early this week, over the weekend, maybe it was um, about uh, about how to neutralize this advantage. Talk, talk about that. Yeah, well, the Hill gave me that coveted Sunday 4 p.m. slot <laughs> for uh, for for the uh, for for the op ads, but I'm I'm well, glad now you've got the coveted lunch hour with Federal Newswire slot to also talk about this. I know we tend to compete the Sunday slot. Anyway, go ahead. And, and and I you know I laid out the case that China should not be treated as a developing nation. This should have been changed long ago. Finally, the Senate has taken uh, some action. There's provisions most recently in the uh, National Defense Authorization Act that would require the State Department to request that the UN change China's um, uh, classification. And that's that's a welcome step. However, China has made clear they're going to say uh, absolutely no. Sure. I don't know what the Mandarin term for "fu" is, but that was the uh, the, the the response that we uh, that 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 the State Department has gotten thus far. So I think the next step is for legislation, and there's a bill by uh, by uh, Senator Barrasso of Wyoming ah. uh, that would defund these treaties until. China is reclassified into a developed nations. And I, th- I think those kind of measures with real teeth are really where we ought to go. Now, I, I, I hasten to add that uh, even if China were to have developed nation status, that would hardly solve the, the climate change agenda. It's still a bad agenda. These are still treaties that we ought to, uh, uh, ought to rethink our participation in. But I think shining a spotlight on the egregious disparity between how the U.S. and China is treated is something that will help lead to 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 those uh, to, to, to the to that revisiting of uh, of this very problematic climate policy. I mean, let me ask you this. This is more of a philosophical question. And I guess I guess it's bound up. I guess the answer is in the question itself, because I was going to ask whether or not we as free marketeers have been wrong about um have been wrong about more trade leading to the political freeing of societies like China's society. But I think the answer is, you can pontificate on this a little bit, is the fact that it's not so much that China has a free economy or free trade, it's that China continues to benefit from these regimes and it continues to sort of skirt the law it's, it helps to perpetuate its bad actions i guess that's what i'm saying if if you have an oppressive a political climate um you take it and you can take advantage of all of these things to help perpetuate that oppressive political climate i'm sorry what are your thoughts here ben well a lot of us thought that if we trade with china and china trades with us uh they'll clean up their act yeah. and boy have we been wrong um, now, what to do about it is another matter. Right. I'm still at, 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 at the end of the day, I'm still a free trader. Sure. But there are certain things that are obvious and handing China an unfair advantage with this foolish classification as a developing nation. That certainly needs to end. There's, there's, there's some things that uh, that 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 we we all ought to be able to to uh, agree on. And in fact, I would I would add, although uh, in the Senate, the Democrats still support these treaties, they are absolutely in favor of the reclassification. So even the Democrats weren't willing to um, defend 
uh, China and China's classification. So it's it's not a partisan issue. So there 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 may be room for continued progress on this front. Yeah, the the, the question the question is whether or not this translates into sub- substantive change at the current administration's State Department, and I'm just I'm not I'm just not sure that they're willing to they're willing to fight that fight. Um, you know, let's let, let, well, let's 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 shift gears. I want to come back to the appliance issue, Ben, because we have these spending bills that have been going through Congress. We've got the courts that are that are out there. You know what what has to happen, or does it? Do we really have to? I mean, is something going to be done via legislation? Is something going to happen via the judiciary branch, or are we going to have to wait until a new administration comes in and and get them to do something through the regulatory process, or is it too late by then? Uh, it's never too late. Uh, it's it's a it's a regulation by regulation uh, uh, fight. So you know, just about every appliance around the house is subject to a bad regulation at some point in the pipeline right now. It's not just uh, stoves. The only good news: TVs are not being regulated. There you go. So they're off the hook. So we're so we should be thankful it's for just that. Your, it's just your your relationship with your cable company that's being regulated. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, well, that's. That, that 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 that's an that's another issue. Yeah. But you know, stoves, refrigerators, air conditioners are being hit on all sides. The cost of them is 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 going up. Uh, furnaces, they're even going after ceiling fans. Now, oh. the only good news is for a few of these, um, the administration has backed off, and they're entertaining weaker uh, regulations that don't do as much damage. So. Um, you know, the, the critics are getting through, but I do think, and I think but, you've suggested this, the real answer is to eliminate the regulatory program. So eliminate the the, the threat of, uh, of of bad regulations, if not today, five years from today. Right, because we're in a we're in a, a, a milieu right now where I, I, I this is what I now understand with this administration, especially you put out the craziest regulatory proposal possible. Right. You go all in. Right, you don't pre-negotiate against yourself. You go and you say, "Okay, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. We're gonna we're gonna make some outrageous demand on electric vehicles uh, in terms of the fleets. We're gonna make an outrageous demand on gas stoves, on air conditioners." And when the comments all come in, they then pull back to whatever the thing is that they wanted initially, and they say, "Look how look how moderate we are. We found a compromise on the position." I mean, am I am I wrong here? I mean. At least that's the sense that I'm getting these days. No, you, no, you're right. The, the 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 fallback position is 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 a regulation that's still bad yeah. enough. And, and 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 in the case of appliances, there's no need for any regulations. Uh, people can decide for themselves. For right. example, there's plenty of information about the energy use. So if you want the ultra efficient model, you can find out which one that is easily enough. The only thing these regulations do is force the politically correct choice on everyone, whether it makes sense for them or not. So there's no need for regulations, stringent ones, less stringent ones. Uh, and yeah, there, there, you know, there is this game where they scare the daylights out of people uh, and then they back off a little bit and, 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 and people feel relieved by, uh, by, by, by the fact that it's not quite so bad. So Ben, I, um, listen, I, I, I asked this of all my, all my guests and I explain it to all my guests and I know my listeners are tired of hearing me explain it, but I, I feel I need to. Um, when I was contemplating starting up a new podcast, I was thinking about doing a podcast called Outside Interests, which is to talk to policymakers or policy folks and political folks about things that they do that are not policy related, that are not politically related. They're, they're outside interests because I think it's important to humanize uh, 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 folks who are doing this work so the folks understand they're not just all, all you know, engaged in, in this kind of activity. So when you're not doing this important work on energy and environmental policy. How are you spending your free time? What are, what are some of your outside interests? Well, I could tell you one of the things about these appliance standards that I hate, because they're becoming less popular, they're often being released on a Friday afternoon, the Friday afternoon news sure. dump, so they, it, 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 which is a sign that we're getting to them, which is good. But what I hate about that is that it can ruin my weekend. <laughs> And what I like to do on the, uh, on the weekend, well, my, my wife, Don and I, we really love history. So, uh, you know, we, we go to antique uh, auctions, oh, even if we don't win anything, it's, it's fun entertainment. And if we do win something, we have a little piece of history to take home. We, we love American 
history. We, 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 we like to visit, especially New England, because there's so much history there. But even here in the, in the Mid-Atlantic, there's a lot of uh, stuff to see. So, so you gotta far, come down to Williamsburg. I've been down to Williamsburg many, many times, is, and I've, I still haven't exhausted it because there's just so uh, there's just so so much there. But I do the cheapskate version. I walk around the buildings, but I don't pay the thirty bucks to go inside. I haven't done that. What yet. you need to do is we need to get you and your wife down here. I'll take you on the Civil War tour because there's, and I'll, I'll, I'll I can sit down and explain to you how the North could have won the war three years early. Uh, had it not been for general incompetence on the part of the the command staff, we'll we'll we'll, we'll bring you down here and and do that uh, to say the least. By the way, have you ever been out? Speaking of antique auctions, going to put in a little plug here. Uh, out in have you ever been out to Crumpton, Maryland, on the Eastern Shore? No, but I've heard about the auction there. Yeah, so Dixon's Antiques out in Crumpton every Wednesday. I've not been for over a decade. Actually, I'm not even sure they're still doing it. I should double check that. But that was always. A great auction when I can make it uh, out there. Ben, how do folks find out more about the good work that you are doing and the good work that the Competitive Enterprise Institute is doing? Well, it's all on our website, CEI.org. CEI.org. Go and check it out. Ben Lieberman, Senior Fellow at CEI. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me, Andy. This has been yet another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer, or as Ben would call me, Loud Andy. Um, a, 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 a moniker that I am I am very proud to wear. I, I wear it as, literally as a badge of honor. Um, uh, if you're watching us, as I've said on YouTube, uh, you can check us out wherever fine podcasts are found. If you're watching, if you're listening to us on one of those fine podcast platforms, uh, check us out on YouTube. It's always fun to watch the videos here. Leave a like, leave a subscribe, and let everybody you know know about the Lunch Hour with Federal News Wire. Have a great week, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream 